that. Did anybody do any assertiveness over the last week? Was anybody practicing assertiveness over the last week? And was it a success? <laughs> One sort of yes, a few chuckles, a lot of smiles. Well, keep practicing, because just like driving the car, it wasn't easy the first time. It was very strange the first time. So keep practicing, making I statements. I feel, when you, can you please? Tonight we're talking about fighting fair, conflict resolution. (coughs) In this lesson, we're going to look at conflict resolution, learning to fight fairly. These skills can heal relationships and develop honest interactions interaction between ourselves. Jesus did not avoid conflict. Jesus did not avoid conflict. In fact, he seemed to be particularly aggressive when dealing with the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. How can we condone such talk? First of all, Jesus said the above without any malice in his heart. So he didn't judge them, condemn them, expect them to be any different. So he didn't have any malice in his heart when he said that. He was telling the scribes and the Pharisees that their inheritance was Satan because their father was Satan, the great dragon. Then they were a brood of little dragons, snakes. He told them truth. This way at least everything was out in the open. We are to do likewise if we are to be children of the light. Conflict is unavoidable. Unavoidable. So we all experience conflict. Conflict is all around us. It starts in our childhood, comes out with our jobs, is present in our families and all relationships. To be human is to experience friction in our relationship with others. So you can't avoid it. Somewhere along the line, you're going to run into conflict. So learning how to handle it in the best way possible is a good start. Two, we all handle conflict in many different ways. We handle conflict in different ways. Some people withdraw from any sign of strife. Other people enter the circle of dispute without hesitation. We all have adapted to discord. So each one have done it in different ways. Some people withdraw, go into their cave, slam the door, don't expect to come out. They're in their cave. Some people that have learned self-confidence might enter conflicts to clear the air, just to get things out in the open, to have it talked about. Other people might use conflict to aggressively get their own way. Remember we talked about passive and aggressive last time. And those are two different ways we all handle conflict. Number three, conflict can be an opportunity or a catastrophe. So it can be seen as an opportunity or we can see it as a catastrophe. It all depends on the way we learn to manage conflict. D, conflict can damage intimacy. Can damage intimacy. Intimacy is important for all relationships. It's what our hearts are hungry for is intimacy. The challenge to develop and grow in our intimacy, to be real, honest, and open. If we don't learn to deal with conflict, we can hinder the growth of the God-given self within and our relationships around us. The word intimacy has often been confused with sex. However, intimacy means how close we let others get the sense of openness, of trust we feel with others, how much we share without fear of losing our own privacy, and physically touching one another. So if you think of the relationships that you have that are good relationships, satisfying ones, it's because there's a good level of intimacy there. And that doesn't mean sex. Just a closeness and and openness of being able to share with them what you're thinking and they share with you what they're thinking. So it's just a sense of of openness, the trust of how close we let other people to us. That for for a lot of people, that's the struggle of their whole life, is how close they're going to let people to them. And if they don't want people very close, then they begin building this wall between them and other people. 
So intimacy is how close we let each other to, to, our, to let somebody else to us. Needless to say, that's one of the jobs that a married couple sorts out is intimacy. How close do they let their partner in? Where is the line that says, no, this is, this is my part of my heart and you're not getting into this part of my heart? But intimacy. Studies show how intimate, how intimacy is one of mankind's basic needs. Babies raised without intimacy by their caregivers will be damaged. If not held or touched, they will be emotionally handicapped. It's interesting that some of the studies that came out of World War I and World War II when there were so many orphanages around. And some of the orphanages were just so busy, all they could do was just prop a bottle up beside the baby to make sure that hopefully that the baby could get fed. But there was no touching and no holding. And some of those babies did not live. So touching is a, a, one of the God-given needs that we all have. And if it's withheld from a baby, it will damage them the rest of their lives. Two, the fear of intimacy hinders Sorry, the fear of rejection hinders intimacy. The fear of rejection. Hostility can destroy relationships and intimacy. Constructive conflict, on the other hand, can build up relationships. Often it's not so much planned hostility that keeps us separated from others, but a fear of allowing them too close. We fear intimacy because it makes us vulnerable. The fear of being rejected is common to all of us. In fact, I reckon 99.999% of people have to face that issue sometime in their life. And especially Christians have to get to the point where they know that they know that they know that God loves them. They're okay by God. He wanted them born into this world. He wanted them to experience life and to work through that fear of, of rejection so deep that they know Father God loves them. And then rejection leaves. But it's a major, major issue when we're talking in in counseling terms. The fear of being engulfed or swallowed up by the other is common. Often we resist intimacy because, one, the space we need to be a separate person, and two, so that the other can't see our real self, our ugly self. So we think if people don't get too close to us, they won't see the real us, and therefore they won't reject us. How true is that? Mm, it's true that that's how, how a lot of people function. Yeah, that's true. But will they see parts of the real us that we don't want them to see anyhow? Yeah, because out of our heart come our actions. And often other people can see our heart better than what we can. So we resist that closeness with other people. It takes a lot of openness to be able to share with other people and get to the point where you're not afraid that whatever it is that you shared with them is going to become gossip. And if it's happened to you once or twice, you close down pretty quickly. So that fear of being open, that fear that someone else is going to take advantage of you, that they're going to see the real you, closes down relationships. It's interesting working through the fear of rejection that for a lot of people it's not rejection because a lot of people as they look around their lives they see that they're not being rejected. In fact, most people have more support and encouragement and compassion given to them than what they realize. So it's not that they are being rejected but it's the fear that they will be rejected that closes this down. So sometimes when you approach it that way you can see it's fear all right, I need to handle this fear like I handle all other fears. Not give in to it, hear what the Lord's saying about it, and overcome that fear. So there's a big difference between the fear of rejection and actually being rejected. So you should act a certain way so, so that... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So the person steps into being very compliant and being what everybody else wants them to be. They become what's called a people pleaser. But the real self is is lost in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that stops real intimacy. 
Because what it does is, is we get acquainted with that person's mask. And then they take off that mask and put on another mask, but we don't see the real person. Mm-hmm. We forget to reject rejection. I like that. Mm -hmm. It's true, because that's what we need to do, is we need to learn to reject rejection and make the choice with our heart to to think, no, I'm not going to take that on. I'm not going to step into it. That's good. Yeah, I like that. Good. So we need to start rejecting rejection. Mm -hmm. I like that. Now, the next thing, we all have different fight styles. So the way that Daniel and I have our discussions will be different than Nick and Tina have their discussions, or Kay and Neil, or or Fiona and Jeff, or Jeff and June, or whoever it is. We all have our own fight styles. And part of the journey is to figure out what is your fight style. So not only can you look at it and change it, but understand why people react to that fight style the way that they do. Number one, our family fight style. So this is where we first pick up our fight style. The way our family of origin settle conflicts sets the pattern for how we presently deal with the tensions. Anyone who grew up in a family where disagreements turned into out-and-out brawls may react in one of two ways. Actually, there's three ways they can react to it. What's one? What's one? They can do the same thing. All right, so just leave your notes for just a minute. I'm just adding in here. Three things that they can do. They'll do the same thing. So if you grew up in a family where it was out and out, free for all, and the way that that mother got her rule over dad was to just push him around a little bit until he gave in, or if big brother pushed you around to get get what he wanted, then you're going to tend to adopt that same fight style when you grow up or as you're living your own life. So you either do the same thing, or you can say, well, Dad was physically violent with me, and so therefore I am never, never going to hit my husband, wife, brother, sister, child, whatever. So you're in reaction, so you go the other way. Or what's the third way to deal with it? Come on, all you people that know Roy's teachings. What's his three little point thing that he talks about? You fight it, you do it, or you... Forgive. You release it. You work it through. So it's the only three ways you can handle things. Is you do the same thing. You swing and do the opposite thing, but it's because it is a swing. It's the pendulum thing. Or you work it through, understand why, forgive him and release it. So, according to our notes here, you handle it one of two ways. You either withdraw or you fight for their point of view. So you either do the same thing or you do the opposite. So if your family was all and all out, out and out brawls, if you do the opposite, you're going to withdraw and not use any physical violence or any aggression or any anything that you think is the same thing that your parents did. So your family of origin affects your fight style. So is somebody brave enough to share with me what sort of fight style they came up with in their family of origin? My father and I would shout at each other for five minutes, then sit down five minutes later and be together. And forget about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, sh- yeah. so if we try to use that fight style with your beloved, what's going to happen? <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. That's right. All right. How else did people grow up? How else did your families handle it? Mine swept it under the carpet. We just don't talk about it. That's right. We we have a disagreement, but we really don't talk about it. We swallowed it, and we hold in the anger and the bitterness, and it grows and grows like what we talked about last week, this proverbial gunny sack. It's bigger and bigger and bigger until one day it's the little straw that breaks the camel's back, and it goes kaboom. And you have you-know-what everywhere. And then that person thinks, well, what did I do wrong? All I did was say something about the dishes. They don't understand that it's just built up and built up and built up and built up and built up. So sweeping it under the carpet, hiding it, how else? My father was sort of in charge of church, and he was in the church, uh-huh. and mum was supposedly submissive, you know, with the hat on and all, but at home she ruled, mm-hmm. and she was quite a, she was a bit 
very goal oriented and harsh sort of personality mm. quite frightened of it. Mm-hmm. The dad was just so loving and caring about us Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's this. Yeah, so I don't know. I think in some ways, I don't know who I'm in the end. I don't know if it was both ways because. Mm hmm. Okay. So a selective, um, some places where it's nice and peace and harmony, but behind the scenes, it's not exactly that. Yeah. So the fight style of a lot of hidden messages, a lot of sarcasm, a lot of innuendo, a lot of putting down the other person in front of friends, you know, all kinds of con- all control sort of issues behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Someone who has grown up with good conflict resolution skills will react differently. They will settle issues, issues fairly. Yeah. <laughs> well, if 5% of the population know how to do assertiveness training on a, a good level, so probably be pretty, pretty close, about the same 5%, I would guess. It would be an interesting survey, though, because it would be a very small percentage. In fact, I think if, if that percentage were higher, we'd have fewer people in counseling than what we do. They will have learned to have set their boundaries, learned to have said things in an open, honest way without destroying somebody else. And if parents could do that, then that's a big jump on the next generation. Mm. So our family of origin, good old foo. And one, one of the sessions that we talk about is the family of origin stuff. And there's just heaps and heaps of it that we don't even realize creeps into our life. So family of origin too, church, also influences our fight style. So we probably should say religion influences our fight styles. Another factor shaping our attitudes about fighting fair comes from, the gro- from growing up in Christian circles. We may have inherited a faulty view of submission, of swallowing the pain at any cost. The Bible does not instruct us to be a doormat. It instructs us how to settle conflicts fairly and with dignity. Following are just a few of the many points the Bible makes. Number one, settle issues before you commune with God. And when Paul's teaching about, um, is it Paul? No, beg your pardon, it's Matthew, so it would be Jesus. Teaching about giving your gifts at the altar to leave them there and go and settle the issue with your brother. Then come and offer your gifts, Matthew 5.24. Keep the trust of confidentiality between the two adversaries and no gossip. So if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So nowhere in the Bible will you find that it says that real submission is swallowing all your hurts and pains and grievances. Does it? Have you found a verse that says something like that? No. In fact, quite the opposite. That because of the the need for people to keep the peace and not have conflict in religious circles, they've emphasized the you know turn the other cheek, the giving nature, all of that, and that's important because there are times when you have to just turn the other cheek, and the Lord expects us to do that with our enemies. So going and resolving the issue is what the what Paul strongly recommended what Jesus showed and what he also did. So you go and resolve your issues with somebody. That way it doesn't just gather up and gather up and just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then pretty soon somebody says, well, this church has hurt me too much. I am leaving. So go and resolve your issues. So the first step is you and go and you talk to that person. And if they don't receive it, then what do you do? Well, first step should be pray about it, beg your pardon, see what the Lord's saying. Because he will say sometimes, well, it's a a chance to practice just swallowing the self-attitude and and working out why that issue bothered you. But sometimes he'll say, go and talk to that person. If they don't listen, what's the next step? Take somebody else with you. So you take a third party that both people will listen to that can be a mediator. Because sometimes it could be that person's own issues that are keeping the whole problem going and having a third person there 
often can help. So if they don't listen, you take a third person and you go and talk to them. So it's like if Eva, can I use you as an example? It's like if I've really hurt Eva, all right, what's her responsibility? She comes to me and talks, talks to me about it. Now, if I feel a coolness between Eva and I, and I think, oh, maybe I have hurt Eva, what's my responsibility? Go and talk to Eva. Say, Eva, is there something wrong between us? So either way, it's covered. Either way, it's covered. Now, if Eva says, hmm, or no, let's turn it around the other way. If Susan says, hmm, up your nose with a rubber hose, I don't care, then what's Eva's responsibility to do next? Besides pray about it. Bring somebody else. Like, bring Jeff along. Because Susan will listen to Jeff, won't she? So Jeff comes along and says, Susan, Eva has a problem here. Can we talk about it? And if it's a case of immorality, like if Eva knows I've been sort of helping myself to the church money behind the scenes, and so it is a big issue, and I won't listen to her talk to me about it, I say, ah, you're just imagining that. And I won't listen to Jeff talk about it, and I say, ah, no, you guys, you're just trying to, you're trying to ruin my reputation. You're trying to get me out of this church, and I don't, I'm not going to listen to you. Then what's the next step? If it's a serious enough issue, you go to the elders of the church. So you go and present what it is that you're feeling and what you're talking through. And, and then the elders of the church would do what? Besides pray about it? Hopefully. Yeah. They'd say, um, Susan, we need to talk about this. Can you come bring... You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> These accounts don't quite match up. We need to talk about it. And then if I say, well, nuts to you guys, I'm going to the next church down the line. What do they do? <laughs> well, before they go to the law, what does the Bible say to do? Sorry? Yeah. It goes before the whole church, so it becomes a public matter. And if I say, well, nuts to this, I'm just going to the next church. What's their attitude toward me? Do they brand me the scarlet woman and put an A on my back of my jumper and say, that's it, we're never going to talk to you again? No. Mm -hmm. So they treat me as though I was a sinner. And how are we supposed to treat the sinners in the world? We're supposed to talk to him, be nice to him, win him to the Lord. So certainly not, not ostracize and kick out and, and um, go down that road because there's been a lot of people hurt when you go down that road. And the whole aim of the whole passage that Paul was talking about is restoration. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's true. So they have to draw the boundary line, yes. They have to either ask you to leave the church or leave that particular group of the church. But it needs to be with the aim of restitution, not just, I haven't matched up to the standards of this church, so I'm out forever and ever and ever. The aim is for restitution. So there needs to be some sort of a a contract with the elders, perhaps, or with the church, that Susan is going to be set aside for six months. That still means loving contact. Like if I were a sinner, they'd still make loving contact. But at the end of that six months, I, I, they said, well, Susan, what do you think? And I say, well, that's to this. I'm going somewhere else. Then that's to the point where they do. They just treat me like a sinner out in the world that doesn't know the Lord. But remember, the whole aim is what? Restitution. And sexual abuse and all that, uh huh. Mm-hmm. It is always very difficult mm. how to balance mm. when, because once, when, as soon as you go to the, to the law, mm-hmm. then the relationship with that person will be great. Yeah. If it's something where the person has broken the law, like if they could prove that I had embezzled church funds, then the law of the land steps in and takes over. But even at that, the whole aim of it is for restitution. If, if I said, okay, yeah, I'm really sorry, but I've got a problem here. 
then part of the restitution would be to get some professional help. And particularly with with people that are involved with pedophilia and and sexual abuse for children, never gets better. Never gets better. They have to have help in order to get better. So some of the restitution might be, okay, Susan, let's get you some help in all of this. If you can't help but do it, or if if financial problems are so much that you've got to do this, you feel like you've got to do this just to survive, well, hopefully the elders would have seen that a long time before then and stepped in to offer some help to poor Susan so that Eva didn't have to be the bunny. But the whole aim of the thing is restitution. Not ostracization, ostracizing that person to never, 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 never have the chance to get back into the, into the fellowship of loving believers, not judgmental believers. And then it also talks about that those of you that, those of you that are more spiritual go and help restore that person. And that doesn't mean someone that thinks they're more spiritual, but just someone that has worked through issues for themselves and has gotten rid of the judgmental attitude, the condemning attitude, to go and work through with that person. So the Bible doesn't teach just, uh, well, Eva, just swallow it. You know, don't worry about Susan, just swallow it and let the anger grow and the feeling of injustice grow. The Bible doesn't talk about that. It says, no, talk about it, bring it out in the open. Now that's got to be with love. That's got to be with, with a sense of bringing back relationship. Because we all know of stories where, you know, people have just been destroyed by church discipline. Think of a case in the the, the church that we started in here in Australia, where, um, you know, a young couple she was pregnant. And what did they do? They brought it to the whole church. <laughs> so I just hope they prayed about it. All right. So our church can influence our fight style. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, some of it depends on how repentant Susan is. And if, 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 if I have so hardened my heart toward anything, then that is one of the last resorts. It's like a woman in a relationship where she is being physically beaten. One of the last resorts is the law of the land that says that you know, the police ought to be called in. So we can bring in the law of the land when someone has such a hard heart, they're not going to listen to the church. Does that help explain it? Some of it? Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah, especially unbelievers. Yeah, yeah. Here we. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if both parties are really willing to do some work on it, then yes, it, it, it needs to be kept within the church. But when one person has so hardened their heart that they're not going to listen to the church, they're not going to listen to God, they're not going to listen to anything then that's one of the bottom line issues that it can be called in. But here again, this is one of the problems with setting a law. You know, if, if, if the law is you don't go to the law, and that's what your church believes, there's always going to be some circumstance in there that, that you really have to pray about, where the Lord says, yes, turn them over to the laws of the land. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, but probably it just depends on how much repentance there is in that person's heart and how willing they are to work it through. Yeah. But you can't set a hard and fast law. I guess is the the bottom line. Yes, and they need help. If they won't take it from the church, then they've got to get help from outside the church. Yeah. And I had a situation a while ago where I could have called the police. Mm-hmm. About a certain situation. I was even told by the person's family I should have called the police. Mm-hmm. But I knew I had some lovely, lovely Christian brothers within the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew about the situation and uh, I just kind of come in. It was mm-hmm. hard. Mm-hmm. But I'm 
think that person would be in town now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't. Yeah. yeah. So, so they. Lord was right there. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had, you know, as I said, some other Christian bodies. Um, mm-hmm. That could help and step in and rescue and stand up for Eva. And, yeah, true. Yeah. So there again, you've got to pray about things and see what the Lord's saying. Because yes, sometimes that brings a person the the fact that we could turn the other cheek and not not bring the law into it. It does. This group tends to feed into and use the other's problems to meet their own needs. So people with dirty fight styles often, and not you can't say it 100%, but often have a codependency issue in there as well. So one gets hooked into the other. Because if you're in a situation where you're constantly getting physically abused, there's got to be some heart reasons why that person stays there. Next, the partners put each other down. This reinforces the other person's low self-esteem. The neurotic codependency develops. Both sides collude to keep the problem going. And the enemy sits back and gets his jollies, right? Mm -hmm. They both further feed the problem behavior, such as the alcohol, rather than work together to eliminate the problem. Dirty fighting encourages the elephant in the house syndrome where no one wishes to discuss the friction that dominates the family. Do you know what I mean by the elephant in the house syndrome? Or it's called the white elephant syndrome? It's a family that grows up with a major big issue, such as alcohol or gambling, but nobody wants to talk about it. So it's like living in this family with a huge big elephant sitting there on the couch beside you, but nobody wants to talk about it. They just ignore the presence of this big conflict this big problem issue. So children who grow up with white elephants in their family, what's their fight style like? (coughs) Compliant? Sorry? Denial? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if if we've learned how to handle our own emotions by just burying them a bit deeper and a bit more, and not talking about them, there's a good chance that that's the kind of relationship we're going to feed into when we get old enough and choose our own partner. So the white elephant syndrome. Number four, male and female fight styles. Oh, goody. Males have a fight style and women have a fight style. I'm sure most of us realize that already. Most of the male-female fighting styles are culturally learned and encouraged by society. In the heat of the battle, destructive methods of fighting are used by both sexes. Both sexes tend to gunny sack, store up the venom, use physical force, either slaps or fingernails, use name-calling, hitting below the belt, mind-reading, withdrawal, or aggression. The book called Intimate Enemy Bach lists three male-female fight styles from his book. So these are three of the most common fight styles. One, the relatively patient attitude of males towards so-called feminine wiles. The common thought by men is that it is somehow unmanly or weak to allow oneself to fight with a woman. So sort of the the Gregory Peck, the... um, um, let's make sure I haven't t- covered that somewhere else. You know, the, the tall, strong, silent type that just sort of put up, puts up with his, the woman dominating him, fighting with him, picking a fight, pushing him around. As a result, many males fail to act and or choose to withdraw. An example of this is the husband who shows an unreal patience with his wife, wife's oft-repeated ravings and attack. So he very patiently ignores his wife's nagging, 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 nagging. And everybody says, oh, he's just so patient with her. By leaving the problem unsolved, he thinks he's doing his manly duty for his wife by not starting an argument. However, all this does is further infuriate her, inflate, sorry, her gunny sack of complaints. So that's one. The, the strong, silent type, the, 
the Rudolph Valentino, the Gregory Peck style that you saw in the movies about 20 years ago, strong and silent, while his wife is just going around the twist, trying to get him to, com to communicate and talk about things. The next one is a relatively patient female attitude toward the non-communication of males. Women tolerate the strong, silent type image in men. They think it's proper male characteristics, possibly learned through the media, possibly learned because that's where their own dad was. And then the other pattern is women tend to use tears while men use withdrawal. Males are good at using the stiff upper lip routine and swallowing their hurts. Now, all of these behaviors will create a high level of frustration, people being too hurt or scared to get to the real issue. So by the time someone's lived 25 years with a strong, silent type, how many things are they going to be there to resolve? <laughs> multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes. One of the she things... And she possibly remembers every one of them. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Sorry? I was just saying, after last week, I went home to the about toothpaste. Good. Yeah. Low priority. Fairly low priority. Okay, how are we doing on time? Yep, okay. Fighting fair. Fighting fair. Well, number five. Number five, beg your pardon. Then there are personal fight styles. Because we are unique individuals, we all have our own fight style, our own, own style of handling conflict. Some withdraw, others come out fighting. By recognizing our own fight style and discussing it with our partner, we reduce the number of unknowns that cause difficulty. Anybody brave enough to share with me their personal fight style? The best form of defense is offense. The best form of an a defense is an the best form of offense is a good defense. Is that what you said? No, no, the, the, the other way around. <laughs> the best defense is offense. Would you like to explain that a little bit more, Jeff? Oh, well, um, I don't handle criticism very well. Mm. I will react mm. rather than respond. So, June learning how to say it in a way that doesn't bring out criticism is a very important thing to learn. Oh, but not not. If, And just swallowed it. Swallowed it. Yeah. Good. Good. So by by stating it in I feel, mm. she could take it. And she could hear what you were trying to say. Mm -hmm. Good example. So personal fight styles. Anybody else brave enough to share? Daniel and I had a little little pact that we were going to try and follow. Notice the word try and follow because it's hard to do in the heat of battle. But whenever, whenever I had an, a, re, a reaction of some sort to what he said, the first thing I needed to do was say, so you're saying whatever, whatever, whatever. So clarify what it is he's saying. I may have shared this before, but the majority of our fights have been over little things where I thought he said one thing, but he said something else. So instead of come out fighting mm -hmm. with, yeah, but, to stop and say, are you saying this? Or do you mean this? Or can you explain that more? Or some sort of, of reflective listening. So stepping out of the defense even and helping him explain or making sure I'm hearing what he's saying first. And then usually in... In the logical way that he thinks, he has a good point. You know, and it's me hearing what he's saying that helps. So stopping the yabbits, 
so there's no yeah buts around the place. So catch the yeah but. All right, fighting fair, capital F, fighting fair. It's impossible to totally escape conflict, but much needless hurt and strife can be avoided by saying things more accurately. We need to learn better communication skills. The goal we need to set before us is dumping one's bucket of tension without filling the other's bucket. So I need to get rid of what's in my bucket and dump it and handle it in the right way so that I don't just dump, fill Daniel's bucket again or fill his bucket up. So it's taking care of my issues without dumping it onto him. And that's harder to do than it is to say, isn't it? Number one, start with your own emotions. Remember we talked about that last time. Of when one person's emotional... And it's not always Susan that's emotional. Sometimes it's a male that can get emotional. Whenever that person, whichever one of us is the emotional one, that's the upset one, that's the hurt one, that's the angry one, that's the, the one that has an issue. It means I have to come to his position first uh, and facing the emotions and working through the emotions. So yeah, Daniel, I can hear you're angry. I can, I can see that you're really upset about this. And then that helps him cool down a little bit. So face your own emotions first. Emotions will always be with us. Man was created in a God, with God-given emotions. Learning what these emotions are, how to express them, and how to use them in a positive way takes time, energy, and practice. Lately I've been seeing that emotions are messengers that our heart is trying to tell us something. So when I get angry at Daniel, what's my heart telling me? That I am angry at Daniel. For whatever reason, that anger comes out of my heart. So my emotions are messengers from my heart. So that helps me look at the emotions and not shoot them, bury them, put them under concrete, explain them away, deny them. Because it's what my heart's telling me, and I've got to listen to my heart. You don't always have to obey your heart, but you've got to hear what your heart's saying. So if there's a lot of anger in there, it's because my heart is angry. So the emotions are telling me what's happening on the inside. And by listening to the messengers, I can get in touch with my heart and I can work through issues. So emotions, sometimes they're just running wild in there. With most women, they are. And a lot of men, too. We know that we feel something, but what is it that we feel? What's the right word for it? Is it annoyance? Is it irritation? Is it frustration? Is it anger? Or is it rage? And a lot of people don't know where their anger fits in there, where their feelings fit in there, where do their emotions fit in there. So finding the right words for the emotions sometimes is the biggest, biggest challenge. And then with finding the right words, it's like finding the right shade of, of gray to black. Where is it in there? Is it just a minor annoyance that has just happened so many times that now I'm in a rage over it? Then putting the emotion in the right peg in there. But the emotions have to be listened to, have to learn how to express them, learn how to use them in a positive way. Because what happens to emotions if they're not expressed in a positive way? Do they just sort of drift away? No. What happens? Give me the, the step by step. What happens to your emotions? They go back inside and they keep coming up. Yeah, but when they go back inside, it's like, it's like if I'm feeding my mind on something that I'm afraid of. We'll use fear because we haven't talked about that one very much. If I spend time thinking about what it is I'm afraid of, okay, I'm afraid that uh, what? Um, Okay, I'll pick something completely unrealistic because it is not a fear that's in my heart, all right, to start with. I'm afraid that Daniel's seen somebody else. Oh, dear. And I start looking for those sort of uh, possibilities. I start double-guessing what he's saying, where he's going, what he's doing. And that fear just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, my body doesn't know the difference between what I'm imagining and what is real. So what's happening with my heart? My physical heart. 
getting a lot more stress, and the heart's beating a lot harder sometimes, pounding a lot harder. What's happening to the digestive system? It's turning up. So all the, the acid that normally would be produced and washed throughout the, the digestive system just tends to collect. So my tummy gets... And what happens to um, my... Um, um, what, my um, circulation? Probably because there's so much blood congregating around trying to get the heart beating like it should that circulation gets all out of balance. So all the body systems begin to be affected by all that buried, kept inside emotion. And the body gets ready to fight or to flight. So two, the two basic instincts that your body knows to fight or to flight. So it gets ready to fight somebody or it gets ready to run away. Now, if I don't release that tension somewhere and I live there day after day after day after day, what's going to happen to all my body organs? They're going to be affected. And after a while, the immune system goes downhill. And after a while, I do get sick. And it all started out because I had an, a fear that I didn't face and I didn't work through. So our body is affected by our emotions. So working through our emotions in a healthy way is physically healthy for us, as well as emotionally healthy and spiritually healthy and every other way healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, start with your own emotions first. Your emotions are valid for you. You cannot help but feel emotions. Some of the problem comes in trying to sort out which emotions you're feeling. Emotions just are. They just, boom, and there they are. You don't choose, okay, today I'm going to feel peace, but I'm not going to feel anger. Today I'm going to feel joy, but I am not going to feel resentment, bitterness, anger. <clears throat> you can't. Emotion just, boom, there they are. So you can't select through the choice, the list, and say, now I choose this one, and this is the only one I'm going to feel. So emotions are God-given reaction to, reactions to things. Did God have emotions? Did God get angry at Israel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you betcha he did. Got so angry at, at the generations around Noah. What did he do? He repented that he'd made human beings. And he drowned all of them but Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives. And then two or, th two or four of everything. But yeah, so God has emotions. And we're made in his image. So we were designed to have emotions. Can you imagine what it would be like not to have emotions? It would be pretty blah. You just sort of blah out all every day, all day. So emotions are important. They add zest to life. They add zing to life. They add a, a sparkle to life. So emotions themselves are not good or bad. I can't say anger is bad, but peace is good, or peace is bad, but anger is good. Emotions just are. It's what I do with my anger that makes it good or bad. So you can still have that emotion, and it's not good or bad in that sense. It's what we do with it that makes it good or bad. It's the behavior. So our emotions are valid for us. I can't say to Daniel, well, you shouldn't be feeling that way, Daniel, because he feels the way he does because he feels the way he does. So our emotions are valid for each one of us. And that's a big thing in counseling when husbands or wives come in and say, oh, well, my husband shouldn't feel that way. I really mean da-da-da-da-da-da. But there are, each of us, our emotions are valid for where we're at. Next, learn to take responsibility for our own reactions. People don't make you angry. If you are angry, you have allowed yourself to be so through your own attitudes. So Daniel doesn't make me angry. I allow myself to get angry because of what he's doing. It's like I remember one story a long time ago. I heard it. Of um, uh, every morning, this young girl rode up and down the elevator to get to her work, and it was about five five stops on the way up to her work. And every morning, she'd catch the elevator and go up to work. And every morning, on about on the second floor, the door would open. And this man would step into the elevator and just abuse the girl up one side and down the other. Just, you know, just abuse her up one side and down the other. And then step back out of the elevator and the elevator would close and she'd go on back up to work. 
And finally, somebody else in the elevator with her said, how can you stand this? And she says, well, it's not my problem. And so she could, could, she could separate herself from the, that other person's emotions and say, it's not my problem. Now, yeah, she probably did need to do something about it so that it stopped. But she didn't, couldn't, didn't need to take it on board, on board and let it make her angry. So it wasn't her problem. So she didn't let it make her angry. So can people, mm-hmm. people, people choose to be angry or not? Mm-hmm. They have their hand so that people are as, most folks are as happy as they choose to be. Mm-hmm. Most folks are as happy as they choose to be. Good. Yeah, I'm repeating it for the table. Mm-hmm. You're saying feelings are, and they just are. Mm-hmm. But here you're saying we have a choice. Mm-hmm. So can we choose all of our feelings? Probably so, based on what's in our heart, based on what issues that are, are in us that are struggling to be heard. So if you had ten different people go through the same situation, two of them would choose to be angry. Two would be choosing to be hurt and withdraw. Two might choose to be um, just turn the other cheek and apply Christian principles and, and handle it that way. Another two might sit down and become counselors. But yes, we choose our own emotions based on what's happening in us. A function of our choice, you betcha. Otherwise, it's like it's like if if something is bothering me. So, for example, Robin, can I use you as an example? If Robin says something to me and I get angry because of it, whose problem is it? It's mine. So when I get upset at somebody else because of their action or their behavior, the issue is mine. But that doesn't leave Robin free to say, well, it's your bad luck, you're angry at what I said. That's true. From the other person's point of view. Mm -hmm. You need to go and resolve it and work it through. But the issue is mine. It was my anger. And it could be that I'm relating to Robin like I did my younger sister. And she always said the same things. And so I'm now getting angry back at Robin because she just stepped into being my younger sister and my anger is really at my younger sister and Robin just copped it. So anytime we feel anger or any emotions, yes, it's my issue. Otherwise, when we stand before Father God, I'm going to be able to say, hey, look, it was Robin's fault. And he's going to say, "Mm, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess I'm going to have to let you off the hook for this one. But no, he's not going to say that. Each person has their own issues to work through. Judy? Uh, I have a situation at work today where I rang the parents to the baby on the house to tell them how the baby was going. And I wasn't really prepared. I knew the baby had a lot of pain in the life, and I wasn't prepared for the reaction, the reaction I got. And she just abused me and swore and carried on. And mm. So the instantaneous reaction, yes, you're going to have that. So the emotions, boom, up they come. I mean, I wasn't angry with it. Mm-hmm. it was just the pain, yeah. So the, the emotions you have to face are your emotions. All right, so you can only deal with your emotions. You can't reach back through the phone and say, hey, lady. You can't do that. So you've got to deal with your own emotions. Now, somewhere in there, yes, can be a boundary where you say, excuse me, you don't need to dump this on me there's nothing I can do about it and I'm yeah yeah but you you know logically that she's saying that out of her own hurt and her own pain and and five years down the track she'll be most embarrassed that she even did what she did probably but yes you look at your own reactions that have come up I mean some of it your own sense of helplessness would have been in there too, their own feeling of, yeah, that's true, I'm, I hurt too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Julie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
It's when Robin said something to me, but I didn't see Robin doing it. And just automatically I flipped into the reaction. My sister used to say that to me. Now maybe my sister had some truth back there. But my reaction and anger is at my sister, not Robin. And yes, that's transference. Sorry, you need to argue. Mm-hmm. And work it through with the Lord of, okay, Lord, what is there in my heart that this is hooked into? And you're right. Yes, it's a transference issue. So if I get really, really, really angry at males in my life, who am I angry at? My father, my brother, or Father God? Or all three at the one time. So my issues then go back to dealing with my brothers, my dad, and Father God. So yeah, a lot of it's transference. Hmm. Can we go back? Uh, yep. Um, I think people are trying to, or well, no, what I'm trying to do is trying to reconcile this mm-hmm. um, uh, contradiction where we're saying that your emotions are valid. Mm-hmm. But we're not saying here that all our emotions are valid except for anger, surely, because there are times when your anger is valid. And, mm-hmm. I, mean, I like to think there are times when mine is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people who continually do us um, violate your rights or, mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. which causes you maybe inconvenience, uh, maybe severe pain or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, is that emotional response valid then? Well, the- maybe even even um, demonstrating it. Well, the the instantaneous flare up of any emotion, that's you know we're human. I mean, unless we've turned into robots, we can't expect to not have any emotion. So the instantaneous anger that you would feel, if you saw a dad beating up his little five year old in the street, I guarantee most of us would feel the anger, the injustice of it. But if tomorrow and next week and the week after that we nursed that, and and got to the point of saying, well. I mean, you know, just call him all kinds of names day after tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I'm sure when Jesus turned the tables in the temple, he was more than just mildly annoyed. I mean, he could have done it out of mildly (coughs) being annoyed, but there probably was some strong emotions in there. But you don't catch him saying, or you wouldn't see in the scriptures the next week saying, well, I'm going to go back and do it again because they haven't listened to me. So the instantaneous... Anger that comes up. That's not the sin. It's what we do with it after that. If we hold it and nurse it and build it and build it and build it, then we've stepped over the line. And the Bible talks about not letting the sun go down on your wrath. So it's almost if you need a a time period, you have until from that point, you feel the anger until the sun goes down to deal with it and to work it through. But if you find that every time you're turning around, people are violating your rights and the anger keeps coming up, then you need to look back at the heart issue of what is there about people violating my rights that I need to look at and work that one through. So does that explain it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Judy. Well, that's where really praying about it is important. Because sometimes he would say, uh, yeah, just leave it with me, forgive her and move on. And sometimes he would say, no, this is an important enough issue that you need to go and confront your brother and work it through. 
or to confront the person. But first of all, we need to deal with it in our heart. Because if, if we take an offense in there, there's something in our heart we need to work through. Sometimes it's because our expectations of people are too high. Like we expect the world to act like a Christian. And is the world Christian? No. So we can't expect them to have the same rules and regulations that we try to live by. And secondly, secondly, it can be because there is something in there in my heart that God's trying to deal with. That's why I'm the one that answered the phone and got that, that abuse hurled at me. So he's trying to reach me and my attitudes. Yeah. Don't most people out there believe it's their right to be angry or whatever? Mm -hmm. And one of the scary things that's happening at the moment that God's becoming more uh, advertised and uh, talked about is this road rage thing. Mm -hmm. So the road if you rage, yeah. Cut someone off mm -hmm. innocently, mm -hmm. and they start road raging you. Mm -hmm. They are going to, you know, get really angry and maybe violent, and you're Hacking yourself because you've done something wrong mm -hmm. and you've got no way of fixing it because if mm -hmm. you stop the car, you're gone. Mm -hmm. you know, gonna... In fact, there's nothing more. How can I say this? Trying to control the uncontrollable is one of the most frustrating things you can do. And you cannot control other people's behavior, you can't control their emotions, you can't make them do anything. Because even God's not going to make us do anything unless we want to. That's a good way of putting it. So he stood up for the rights of others, particularly the poor and the, 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 the sinners, the helpless and women during his time, yes. Mm -hmm. But he didn't stand up and defend his own rights. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the balance between going out and fighting for your own rights in the doormat. Yes, you'd expect a balance there. But to to be active for other people's rights. Mm -hmm. Jesus said you can mm. uh, get overwhelmed by it. You know, you know, yeah. That's true. Yeah, and he didn't just go on and on and on in his ministry, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He he did draw a boundary line, and he went and took care of his own time with the Father. Yeah, that's true. Very true. Then, D, begin to discover causes and root issues. Unresolved hurts are usually at the bottom of long-term conflict. Fights about children might not be the real issue, Feelings of betrayal from last night's party might be. Um, I think it's supposed to be the other way around. Feelings of betrayal from last night, what happened with your partner, aren't the root issues. It might be feelings of betrayal about children that happened a long time ago. So look for the, the causes and the root issues of things. All right, so in that case, fights about the children might not be the real issue that's happening in the here and now, but the real problem might be feelings of betrayal that came from last year's party. And so it's, it's someone carrying some grudges, carrying some, some resentments for what happened in the past, and it's like every issue then becomes a, a, a chance to prove or to, to pull that partner down. Yep, and you'll find that in counseling. A lot of times the things that the person's coming to present with are not the root issues that they really need to deal with or that's the real bottom of where the problem is. It's hard to learn new communication patterns while you are still carrying hurts from past conflicts. Carrying old emotions will cause a degeneration in any relationship. Whether or not your partner agrees or even works for further progress in the relationship, address your own issues. 
Often the solution begins with just one person and change spreads to both people. So you work with your own issues. Practice forgiveness and letting go whenever it's needed. Some issues are not worth fighting over. So choose the issues. Pray about it. Hear what the Lord's saying. And some issues he will say. This is an important enough issue to make assertiveness training, put it into practice. So I'm feeling upset. When you do whatever, 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 can you please whatever? And most people approached in a logical, clear fashion without an overload of emotions will say, oh, I didn't know that really bothered you. I'd be glad to differ different. Now that I know, I'll try not to do the same thing. I think the example that we talked about last week of the toothpaste that I could trade Daniel that for, no, it was shutting the closet door. I could trade him for the fact of leaving my slippers in the middle of the floor and that he trips over in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Didn't really happen, actually, but anyhow. And Daniel would say, well, that's Susan's story, and she's sticking to it, right? <laughs> okay, so some issues just aren't worth fighting over. But if it's a long-term conflict that just grows and grows and you find... Your emotions still keep happening with that issue. Then you need to pray about it and see what the Lord's saying. So work on your own issues. And then if the Lord's saying, yes, make an example of this and talk this one through, then do it. Repeated hurts cause barriers to intimacy. We learn to use defense mechanisms to cope with these hurts and to keep us from getting hurt again. And the following are some really interesting defense mechanisms. Analyzing, antagonizing, attack, attacking, avoiding, blaming somebody else, complying, condemning, showing contempt for that person or whatever it is, debating, defiance, denying, generalizing, grinning, intimidating, joking, justifying, laughing, minimizing, projecting, questioning, silence, staring, switching off, threatening or withdrawing. And that was such an excellent list of things that, that we all flip into sometimes that we need to work on. Two, learn to handle the heat of the moment. Learn to handle the heat of the moment. Learn to let emotions cool down before you try logic. And we've already talked about that one. As one author put it, in this emotional condition, you're beautifully equipped for a brawl and rather poorly equipped for a cool, calm, logical discussion. So with all that energy running inside of you because of the anger going round and round, you're more likely to fight than you are to sit down and discuss it in a cool, calm manner. So sometimes saying that to the person, look, I hear you're, you're pretty angry about this. How about if we decide just to, to go away and talk to the Lord or just go away and think about this for a little bit and then come back and talk about it? Provided it's not at 11 o'clock at night, your partner will probably say, yeah, that's a good idea. Three, agree on rules for dealing with conflict. Agree on the rules. So talk about conflict before conflict is in the heat of the, the, emo- the moment. Take, a mo- take the time to mutually agree on rules for handling conflicts before you begin to discuss them. This will help resolve the problem quicker in the long run. Agreeing on the rules can protect the less aggressive fighter. They can now lower their barriers without fear of revenge tactics. So if Daniel and I talk about some ways to solve the conflicts that we very, 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 very seldom have. <laughs> but if we talked about some of the, the ways that we want to handle conflict and we agree on it, such as nothing past 1030, please, because I'm just so tired, I can't get into a very debating mood and I can't defend myself. So things like time limits, set some time limits. Um, just like when, if you're playing golf with someone that's a very excellent golf player, you probably have to have what's called a handicap. handicap. So if, if your partner is an excellent debater that can just go round in circles around you with words, you know, work out some sort of a, a handicap that you both agree on. 
So agree on some, some rules for dealing with conflicts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we have our workshop on next Thursday night. So agree on the rules. And that can help protect the less aggressive fighter. So if, if your fight style is one of just withdrawing into yourself and closing up and not wanting to talk about issues, talking with, with the people in your roommates or your partner and agreeing on some ways to help you get out of that withdrawing frame of mind before it happens and discuss it in a way so that they know what they can do to help you when you get into the, the cave or when you get into the withdrawal so that they know what they can do if that happens. So agree on some rules. Four, practice reflective listening. Practice reflective listening. I already talked about this with the yeah buts, but it's important to feed back to the person what they have said. This shows you care enough to really understand their point of view. You could say something like this. Daniel, I hear you say that you're most upset with me about my slippers. And he could say, yeah, Susan, I am tired of tripping over them. And then if you're keeping on with your reflective listening, what could you say next? Then you're tired of tripping over them. You're tired of tripping over them. He says, you betcha, you hear my message once and for all. And then somewhere in there you need to say, yeah, okay, I didn't realize that it was a problem to you. I will try and watch the slippers in the middle of the floor. But I'll trade you something if you'd like. <laughs> Everyday situations give us limitless opportunities to explore our partners, our roommates, the person that we're living with, their real feelings and needs. Allow yourself to be truly interested in them. How we respond to, the, to our partners, C comments will either build up communication or it will cut off intimacy. So learn to hear what that other person is really saying. And that's called reflective listening. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that on next Thursday night when we do sort of a workshop. I'm trying to design a skit, to, a little play to put on for you to show you some terrible fight styles. All right, number five. Yes, good um, point. Yeah, we need to have the timing right. So when the person is in the good mood to talk about conflict and resolving conflict, if they can be logical and talk about it then, then that's good. But if, if you have a roommate that does not want to talk about it from square one, yeah, then you've got problems. So then work on your own issues, use reflective listening, and try to watch your own communication style and do a lot of praying. Mm. Good point. Keep respecting the person. Keep respecting the person. Each person sees life and truth from different angles. Trying to influence your partner with your own view is often counterproductive, especially if you do not understand their point of view to start with. Would somebody like to turn that heat down just a little bit? Thanks, Judy. Developing a healthy atmosphere of mutual respect helps each person keep a genuine sense uh, sorry, a unique sense of self and fosters true communication. We show our partner respect by listening to them with understanding. Our tone of voice, selection of words, body language, facial expressions, and so on give away our true feelings. By castrating our partner with name-calling or, or emotionally laden words, you are really showing your lack of respect for them. Being indifferent to your partner's anger and pain, bless you, is a clear sign of a dying relationship. Ouch. It's destructive to fear a partner's aggression. Better that we accept and air hostile feelings and then work for a settlement. Six, be aware of the downward spiral in fighting. Avoid the temptation to just hurt each other. This escalates the intensity of the battle. 
When both partners are aiming for revenge, they will not solve the issues or gain more intimacy. And that's a very common problem in couples that are just, it's like they're hacking each other to death with their words. The talking at or past your partner also leads to a degrading of the relationship. It often takes an act of willpower or moral courage to set aside what you feel are your rights. However, giving up a self-righteous position often cools down the hostilities. So when hostilities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and warfare is happening at an alarming rate, sometimes one person, by an act of their will, just to say, hey, this is getting out of hand. I see I've hurt you. Please forgive me and then try to walk away from it. Sometimes helps. So that takes an act of will. (coughs) Refuse to yield to the temptation of striking out when hurt. This will benefit both partners, even if it's one-sided. So if you've grown up in a family where mom and dad just really went at it, both words and pushing each other and shouting, when you have your own partner... That's going to be the temptation to do the same thing. But you need to refuse to yield to that temptation and work it through. And even if one person refuses to play the game, that's going to break off the hostilities. Because it takes two to fight. Capital G, Guidelines for Fighting Fair. Never aim your remarks below the belt. Hitting hitting the other person's weak spots in order to hurt your partner destroys relationships. Be careful of being glib and intolerant of the other's view. Select the best time to work through issues. Be specific about what you're fighting about. Specific. What is the issue that's bothering you? Try to keep your grievances to the present and not to the past. Issues should be dealt with as soon as possible. Perhaps you need to declare a special purpose fight to clear up all past injuries. The following are poor tactics. Giving hints instead of clear messages. Withdrawing, using tears to manipulate. Notice this is to manipulate, not when a person's hurt, but to manipulate your partner. Dragging up past hurts and guilts. Using sarcasm. Some people get really good at that. Putting labels on your partner, like calling them a coward, childish. Never. Ensure that there is a reason to confront. Have you some idea of the changes you want in the relationship? What compromises are you willing to make? Think through what really bothers you. Determine what you can forgive, forget, and leave behind. Six, do not guess at what's in your partner's mind. You're not a mind reader. Ask your partner to check and see if your perceptions are accurate. This helps to keep the discussion clear and on track. Be careful to not get into mind reading the other person. Use I messages rather than you messages. Using the first person shows you are taking responsibility for your own feelings. Remember, it takes two to keep a problem going. Take credit for your part of the problem also. So I messages, we talked a lot about that last week. So I feel upset when you do whatever, whatever, can you please? Not you make me upset and I am so angry that you do this to me. We allow that to do, that to happen. We choose what emotions. We have to take responsibility for the emotions that we're showing. Eight, be careful of generalized statements. You always squeeze the toothpaste the wrong way. And all he has to do is catch me one time when I'm not doing it, and the whole thing just goes out the window. So always, never, all those sort of generalized blanket statements. Number nine, talk about the good as well as the bad. Use the sandwich method when trying to correct someone. Do this by first giving them some affirmation, followed by the correction, then summarized by some encouragement. Doesn't that sound like teacherese talk? Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
So if, if, if Daniel has left the milk out overnight and it's gone sour, I could say, Daniel, I really enjoy when you make French toast for me in the morning, and it tastes so good. But when you leave the milk out all day, it goes sour. So tomorrow morning when you make me pancakes, <laughs> which I really enjoy, Daniel, can you not leave the milk out? So talk about the good as well as the bad. Ten, do not overload your partner with grievance. Overload. You know how it would feel to have a friend come along with a long list of gripes about your relationship. So be gracious and shorten your list. A few fights, well done, are much better than one big explosion. Eleven, remember there is never a winner in a brawl. Never a winner in a brawl. The aim is for both people to win by solving the problem. And most conflicts are a lose-lose position, or one person is more dominating than the other one, so it's, it's a win for them, but it's a lose for their partner. So the aim is for a win-win situation where both people win, not where one wins and the other doesn't, because it's the old story of you may have won the battle, but you lost the war. Twelve, take stock of what the conflict achieves. So if you've had a um, right royal discussion with your, your, your roommate, your partner, whoever, and nothing has come out of it except a lot more hurt feelings, has that been a constructive conflict? No. But if you come out of it with both of you feeling that, okay, now I understand my partner better, my roommate better, and I can respect their rights better, I can respect what they want from me better, then it's a win-win situation. You've both learned something coming out of the conflict. Conclusion. Following the rules of far fair fighting are never as simple as just intellectually learning them. You need to be practiced. They need to be practiced. So it's very easy to sit here and, and or even stand here and talk about how to have a good constructive fight with your roommate. But in the heat of the battle, a lot of that stuff goes out the window, doesn't it? So thinking it through, getting it down into your heart, practicing, even if you have to practice with, without that person being there. So Tina could say, okay, now I'm going to put Nick in the chair and I'm going to talk to him. So she imagines Nick in the chair and she talks to him and works through an issue that way. So practice, practice, practice. Two, the challenge to renew the mind and work at the heart level. This is what true religion is all about. So to renew the mind and work at the heart level. Three, daily pressures of life give us an ideal testing ground for our faith. How real are we with God and each other? How much will we allow Him to test and to reshape us? Four, it's all too common for the wife to be in heavenly... <laughs> in heavenly places within the church. And the husband, he's doing his own thing too, whether ministry or having gone fishing. Hmm, interesting comment. Okay, we'll leave that one. Exercise number one. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's probably more of a main point than a conclusion for one thing. All right, sometimes, particularly for wives that get really on um, overload status, and are really involved with the church up to their eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And so husband might feel, well, how can I compete with God? And so he may opt out, and he may go out and go fishing, or else he's so busy doing what he wants to do as well that both of them are, what's the saying, too heavenly-minded to be any earthly good? I think that's what that after is after. All right, let's do some exercises here. We'll stand up and have 15 touch toes, all right? <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Number one, I want you to write your first response to the following situations. So, Mom to Dad. Honey, looks like I'm going to lose my job when the company gets reshuffled. So you're going to have to tighten up your spending. It's your first reactions. What's your response back? If that was if that was said to you, what's your first response? 
Mm -hmm. So it's mom talking to dad. So it's your partner talking to you. It's your roommate talking to you. It's what about your spin? That's like who? <laughs> <laughs> okay, write it down. Write it down. First reaction, not one that you think about logically and with good communication skills. <laughs> you can see where I'm headed already. Okay, next one. <laughs> next one. Dad is talking to his oldest daughter, Jenny. Or sorry, Dad, yeah, Dad is talking to his oldest daughter. So there's three people in this picture. There's dad, the oldest daughter, and then Jenny, the youngest daughter. And dad is saying to the older daughter, there's an article in this magazine about the pill. Jenny ought to read it. Now, if you're the oldest daughter, what's your reaction? I'm struggling, but I'll try. It's kind of hard to step into that role. Yes, I realize that. <laughs> So what's the reaction back to dad? And the na the last one. 16-year-old daughter to mom. So your mom in this situation, you're answering back to your daughter. And the daughter says, all my friends are going to this crazy party. I don't know if I really want to go. Now, the object of this little three-sentence test is which of, those, which of the answers fit into the following category? Were you ordering, directing, or commanding? Warning, admonishing, or threatening? So when Dad was responding back to Mom about losing her job, or oldest daughter back to dad, or mom back to her daughter. Were they advising, giving solutions or suggestions, lecturing, teaching, giving logical arguments? Circle the one that most fits you, your three answers. Praising or agreeing, name calling, ridiculing or shaming, interpreting, analyzing or diagnosing, reassuring, sympathizing, conjoling or supporting, Probing, questioning, or interrogating. Withdrawing, distracting, humoring, or diverting. Which did you find your three answers fit? Anyone want to be brave enough to own up to anything? Question. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> yes, Jeff? Questioning? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, what's wrong with that whole list of 12 things? Isn't that part of good communication? <clears throat> Very good question. Number three. Mm -hmm. Okay, number three. Evaluate how you could have answered each situation so that the conversation would have continued. So, for example, 16-year-old daughter to mom, my friends are all going to this crazy party. I don't know if I really want to go. The object of what mom says back to her daughter should help the conversation continue, not cut it off. 
What's the way of cutting off the conversation? You always go to terrible parties anyhow, so what's one more crazy party that you're going to go to? <clears throat> you're just a tr crazy daughter, so what would that do to communications? Bang, down it goes. Or, yeah, that could turn out to be a pretty crazy party. You might have a lot of crazy boys there, so you better be careful. What's that going to do to a 16-year-old? Bang, goes the, the, the wall down. Or, um, what's another one? Lecturing, teaching, interpreting, analyzing. So you really um, go into this crazy party. Yeah, well, the last one you went to was crazy as well, and it, it just got out of hand. And, and flipping into the logic of, yeah, well, then they had to call the police, and then dad, his dad had to do this. And you know, what's happened to the 16-year-old somewhere along the line? Down's gone the communication. All right, give me some feedback. How could mom have answered her 16-year-old daughter to keep the conversation going? Is there something else she'd rather do? Is there something else she'd rather do? Yeah, good. Okay, now you have to be careful with whys because they usually turn out to be logic. So but that would be a good one. So I hear you don't want to go. What's... Okay, sometimes you can come on with the, do you want to talk some more about it? Sometimes they'll just say, oh, no, not really. Well, what do so you the, mean crazy? What do you, yeah, okay. What do you feel when you say crazy? What do you mean? Mm -hmm. So what makes you think the party's going to be crazy? So, yeah. So the object is to say something that gets her to talk back to you. And continue the conversation going. What a bad sign it's our okay not to go. Yeah, you probably could say that. But I'm then that sort of. Response, but also depends where mm -hmm. your relationship's at. Like mm -hmm. I know with our youngest daughter, I could say, maybe God's trying to show you something, you know. Mm -hmm. With your daughter to start with. But yeah. good communication, you're after a good relationship. So if you had a daughter that you could say, well, uh, something about praying about it and seeing what the Lord's saying, yeah, that shows a good, a good relationship. So communication is after keeping that good relationship, not shutting down the doors of the, converse, of the communication. So what this is saying, you just be, have to be careful in shutting the doors of communication. And you shut those doors by ordering, warning, exhorting, advising, lecturing, doing all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. A lot of our solutions here have been question, asking questions back. Uh -huh. um, so how yeah, is question in this instance uh, communication is what we're mm -hmm. Well, it would depend on how you do it. Questioning in the sense of trying to get out of her all the details about the whole thing and just continually sort of badgering right. in a questioning sense. Yes. But questioning in the sense of what makes you feel it's going to be a crazy party. Question in the sense that it's reflective listening. That's what this is after, is some reflective noisy. listening. Moralizing? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Moralizing her, telling her what you should, what she should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So, just following on from what Nick was saying, I just said simply don't go there. Yeah, it just affirm your choice, but it's pretty much going to knock the conversation. It would knock the conversation ahead. Now, that might be what you say five minutes down the line after you've found out and encouraged her to talk a bit more. Then you might give her your fatherly advice and say, well, then the choice is yours of going. But it sounds like if you're concerned about it being a crazy party and on and on and on of what she's just told you, feeding it back to her in a reflective type of listening and saying, well, it sounds like you're feeling you better not go. Okay, understand what that's about? Catch the heart of what it's trying to say? So it's helping communication keep on going. And especially the one about teenagers. It's like there's a window of opportunity when you can talk to teenagers. And it's usually their window of opportunity, not when you want it to be. So certainly the last two. <laughs> that's right. 
then you need an extra special patience. Yeah. Anyone like to share the answers with mom to dad about losing the job? So turning it around, diverting it onto the other person. Yeah, it's a very common way of, but again, what that does is just close down communication because they get defensive and, and then it turns into a big battle. So reflective listening, that's the heart of what that's trying to say. Appendix A, your personal fight style. And we've got about five minutes. So I'll give you a chance to get started in on this, or you can take it away and do it. This is one of these. Rank the following questions according to how often and or how strongly the answer is yes applies to you by giving yourself points from 1 to 10. Your instruct instructor will tell you how to interpret the results. Well, I'll give you some time to do it as homework, and then when we come back for the um, workshop next Thursday, we'll talk about it. So you give yourself a rating from 1 to 10. 1 is never, 5 is about 50% of the time, and 10 is always. So you can have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Probably even could have half points in there if you're really undecided on what you do. So take this home. Um, and give yourself a rating on each one of those 20 things out of 1 to five, one to 10. Any questions? So rather than do it right now, because Susan's still trying to talk to you. <laughs> Good. We'll take that home and do it for homework. Now, don't forget, next Thursday night's a workshop-type setting. And so what, what we usually do for a workshop is um, we'll not have the tables out. We'll just sit in a circle and talk through some of these issues. And if I can get a skit made up for Daniel and I, we'll show you terrible conflict re resolution style fights and have you analyze and pull it apart and tell us what we've done wrong. Any questions? Comments? Would you like me to pray for you? And then we'll stop. Please. Yeah. Well, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for the time that we've had to look at these issues. And Lord, we want to especially thank you that we live in a country where we can stop and come aside and, and talk about these sort of issues or that we can meet together and, and uh, talk about you or be involved with things that, that you want us to be in, involved with. And we thank you that we live in a country where we have that freedom. Lord, I'd ask for a good night's sleep for every single one of us. And we ask that you show us and help us to resolve and work through the issues in our heart that may be causing the, the bad communication, the, the lack of intimacy in our own lives. Lord, you see our hearts. You know exactly what's there. So I ask that you help each one of us to open our heart more and more and to let you touch our heart and work through the issues that are there. Lord, I commit us all into your hands as you bring us back safely next week. Help each one of us to draw closer to you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name, amen.